Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Star Trek Lower Decks Season 5 Episodes 1 and 2, Dos Cerritos and Shades of Green. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review episodes of Star Trek Lower Decks. Um, so I have to start with a spoiler warning for Lower Decks up to the first two episodes of Season 5. If you have not seen up to this point, you will not want to watch this video. Otherwise, some things will be spoiled for you. So, <clears throat> I got my, my Lower Decks shirt on. <laughs> you got to show that off. And also, you can see in the background here, here, I'll put it for you. My Lower Decks Funko Pops. There they are. You can see them a bit closer this way. Ooh. <laughs> anyway. So. <clears throat> if it wasn't clear, I'm a huge fan of Lower Decks. <laughs> In fact, I think it's fair to say. I was thinking about this today. And I think it's fair to say that Lower Decks is my favorite of the modern Star Trek shows. Uh, even more so than Strange New Worlds after Strange New Worlds lackluster season two. I mean, it wasn't a terrible season, but it wasn't as great as season one. So after that season, I think for now, I'm going to say Lower Decks, but it depends. We've still got more Strange New Worlds to come, so we'll see about that. But I think so far as it stands, um, I would say Lower Decks is my favorite Star Trek show of modern Trek, that is. Um... So, very excited about it. Uh, I decided to review the first two episodes of the season uh, in one video. They aired uh, together, obviously. Last time, last season for Lower Decks, they did the same thing for season four, where they aired the first two episodes in the same night. But that time, I decided to review each episode in its own separate video. I'm too lazy to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, too lazy to do that this way. And plus, I didn't. I found it was I don't know a bit unnecessary. They're airing on the same night. I'll just review them together because why not? But I will separate them out in this video, though. So <clears throat> I will say about both of the episodes is that they were both okay. They're not as great as I say. How much I f I fucking love this show. There's a Boimler say, I love this show. Anyway, sorry, I'm playing with my toys. Don't have very many of them. I'm not a huge toy collector. I mean, you can see a couple back there. But anyway, so, yeah, I was really looking forward to these episodes, and I think I, both of them were just okay. Um, I mean, good okay, not meaty, not like totally in the middle they're in the middle of being good if you know what i mean <laughs> they were both good um but okay not like fantastic or amazing which i'm hoping will come later in the season i will say my critique of both episodes is they seem to have a lot of like side little storylines or little character beats that just don't amount to anything. They just pop up and don't go anywhere and just disappear and fizzle out. Uh, and plus, I'm not quite sure where they're going to take the character stories with our main characters this season. I get an inkling, most of all with Boimler, but the others I'm not quite sure because all the other seasons, especially last season, had a very distinct character journey for their characters but um we'll we'll see <laughs> we'll see how that goes so i want to talk about the opening credits first of all and how they have the logo title that says star trek lord dex they have the trails running down from the logo which is uh what they did in season five of star trek next generation they only did it for season five uh where they had the trails going down the logo of star trek and next generation a lot of people complained about it and said it looks cheesy i never had a problem with it but i do like that they did that for lower decks in its fifth season as well that's a nice little subtle easter egg which which I really appreciate. 
And then there's the whole sequence that changes every year where the Cerritos comes across these ships fighting. And I believe in season one it was just Romulans and Borg. But every year they add more to it. Like they added like Crystalline Entity and uh, the Pro from Star Trek IV and I don't know, several other things. This year I think, I believe, the Klingon ship that's being chased by Breen ship, I think that's new. They add the glowing hand of Apollo from Who Mourns for Adonais. I think that was grabbing the Borg ship and they added uh, you see a Tholian web too that comes on at the end. And I heard someone say that they had V'ger there too. I didn't notice V'ger. I'd have to watch it again. But yeah, it's just a, more of a concophony of all these different things. So now it does really seem like the Cerritos is very correct for running away from this battle. But yeah. So I'll start with the first episode, Dos Cerritos. Um, I'm going to get in, I'm going to save most of the Tendi Orion stuff uh, for the next episode and just talk about it all at once in that episode. I will say the thing about the. The episode starts with her, like, attacking the. Um, collectors whatever i mean i saw that as a a pre-release scene while i was waiting for season five to come out so it's kind of like already knew it and it was just like watching something i've already seen <laughs> so it's hard for me to kind of judge it in that way um and uh but it seemed okay i guess um, and then Tendi it was like almost immediately, it did seem a little bit counter productive or a bit, um, anticlimactic because the big cliffhanger of, of season one, or sorry, of season four was that, oh, Tendi's going off and she's forced to be an Orion pirate and she's leaving the Cerritos. And then this episode, like, almost immediately comes out with oh all you gotta do is get this ship and you can go back to the Cerritos so that's kind of but I knew that would happen in fact to be fair I was hoping that would happen because I didn't like this storyline I didn't like this cliffhanger so the sooner they get it over with the better the happier I will be but it, at the same time even though I'm happy they did that does make it seem kind of pointless. It's like, what's the point? Although I will admit, it's not as bad as what they did between with season three's cliffhanger, where that was resolved entirely off screen and it was just told to us in like some monologue flashback. So I will agree that's worse, but still, I don't know. It makes me feel like there is no point in it whatsoever. But as I said, I'll get into more detail about that when I cover the next episode. Let me stick with this episode and go to the main plot with the Cerritos going to the parallel universe. This is something I saw in the trailers and I was a bit excited for. And yeah, I mean, there were parts of it I really liked. There were some definitely funny jokes. I do think it's an interesting character beat with... Uh, Mariner that her parallel universe part is Becky Freeman and kind of makes fun of the fact oh you chose to go by your uh, middle name Mariner in order to distance yourself from your mother how cute and it was like saying how that's stupid of her to do um, and also I like the um, um, the joke with Talyn I thought was hilarious how they're basically the same person except one says fascinating the other says remarkable and that's the only difference between them and then that one scene where uh, Mariner was trash talking her counterpart uh, to Talyn and Talyn's like are you doing this trash talking because you believe I am from your universe and she's like oh shit <laughs> couldn't tell you apart that was kind of funny um, but I don't know, I feel like, and I think the Boimler thing will definitely have implications going forward. It seems like the season's going to, Boimler's character story of the season's going to be him trying to live up to his counterpart and trying to become him because he was like more confident. He was like, I'm putting command all the time. And he had a beard. <laughs> definitely making a Riker commentary there. Um... It did seem a little... They already had did a Boimler duplicate thing with with a William Boimler, which 
when are we ever going to fucking see? I wonder if they're just going to drop that storyline entirely. It feels like they might. I don't know. We'll see. But, I mean, I know it's different. It's not the same thing. The, the transporter duplicate, and this is a parallel universe counterpart. So, it's, it's different. Um, I'm glad it didn't do the whole Spock cliche with the, the goatee kind of thing. Or, at least, I didn't. I didn't uh, notice them doing that. So, yeah. Because that's a bit tired of a joke at this stage. So, there have been so many parodies and jokes of it. Uh, even, like, um, like Discovery had Sarek having a goatee. And Enterprise, of course, had Savol having a goatee. So, I'm glad they didn't give Talen a goatee or something like that. Um, maybe someone had a goatee. But I think Bo uh, Boinler's beard was definitely not supposed to be that i got more of a Riker vibe from that but other than that i feel like most of the storylines in this episode or little character beats kind of felt like they all fizzled out and didn't go anywhere particularly when like at first the two cerritos are getting along fine and everyone's like oh yeah meet up with their counterparts it's gonna be fun or whatever and then they all the counterparts start like attacking each other and getting like mad at each other like they go into a cargo bay and everyone's screaming at their counterpart i love how we see the two livics <laughs> and we get the other characters that we've seen um like the Kinzi what's that called Kinzetti or whatever they're called Kin kiniti whatever those things are called anyway um so that's kind of funny and then they had like you know the two um God, I'm blanking on his name, the Tamarian guy, the security guy, um, who talks like Darmok. Uh, the, the two of him uh, attacking each other. I do have to mention how they had the two ransoms attacking each other, but they were like, arguing with each other and yelling at each other, but they kept calling each other handsome. It's like, shut up, you handsome looking man. <laughs> like, I do have to say, I did like that. And so it seemed like they were turning it into a storyline about their, and then they revealed that, of course, that Becky Freeman was like, a, you know, a Jellicoe type captain. I will make that analogy of like being a total asshole and dressing down this crew and constantly throwing people in the brig. So I, to me, I thought, oh, this is the big reveal. That this is actually uh, an evil universe. Uh, it seemed like not totally evil, but a bit more fucked up. And um, because at first they presented it as if, oh, it's very similar to our universe. Kind of like a parallels kind of thing when Worf would jump to other universes that were very similar with just some slight differences. And it seemed like that's what they were going for at first. But then when everyone started like being dicks and attacking each other and... Um, it was revealed that Becky treated everyone like shit. I was like, oh, so this, this is more of a, not flat out evil as in a mirror universe, but more sort of aggressive and definitely not as, you know, pleasant as our universe. But then they promptly dropped that. Uh, and I feel like in the end, the alternate Cerritos crew actually turned out to be pretty good guys and they helped uh, Mariner get back to her rifle ship and they seemed very helpful to her. And plus, um, like the Rutherford counterpart seemed like he was a total dick and all emotionless at first. But then, like, once <laughs> our Rutherford, or we call him Otherford, <laughs> that was cute. But our Rutherford tried to, you know, adjust his program, and all of a sudden he was a good guy. And plus, Boimler was always, was being, like, a stand-up guy the entire time, and he was being very nice. Like, it seemed like, so the, the whole trope of, oh, these, you know, you don't get along with your counterpart, and they're all attacking each other. But then, Boimler and Rutherford got around along just fine with their counterparts so i don't know that whole thing felt very unnecessary so i thought they were going in the direction of oh this is actually a kind of evil universe but then they were like nah never mind it's actually just a fine universe so you know pick your side <laughs> like i don't know i mean some i know some people are gonna say oh they were never saying it was an evil universe but i got that impression but then they took that impression away from me and so afterwards i'm like well what's the point 
of having all the counterparts attack each other. I know they're going to say it's like the two Riker thing in Second Chances where you just don't get along with their counterpart, but quite frankly, I never liked that storyline in Second Chances. And I, it seems completely more unnecessary and just blinks in and out in this episode. Um... Yeah, and the whole Rutherford thing where he was like emotionless and um, and had all these more robotic enhancements and was a lot more cybernetic and had like this third hand. I love when when they were leaving though when Rutherford was uh, hugging Rutherford and, and the, the third hand came out and started patting him on the back. That was actually kind of funny, but... I don't really see the point of that either. I mean, I get what they're saying because Rutherford was really depressed of Tindy left and that he was, you know, burying himself in the ridiculous amount of work to try to forget about her. Uh, and Rutherford apparently took it to the extreme where he, like, removed his memories of her and removed the emotion and became this emotional, emotionless robot. To try to block it. So it's you know saying the dangers of what Rutherford could do. But Rutherford was so like nice to Rutherford. And, and I don't know. I don't think. I don't know. I don't think the storyline. If it didn't really feel that. Like that made that, bit, that much of a difference. And the whole thing with. You know Becky Freeman trying to you know switch sides and go to the other universe it seems like they just had to do a cliche body swap thing and, and again that didn't really go anywhere it seemed obvious to me she was doing a terrible job of impersonating mariner it seemed obvious to me that they they were gonna figure it out right away i did kind of like though when <laughs> mariner finally made contact with freeman uh, she was like, no, it's me, I'm the, I'm your mariner. She's like, yeah, I know, I figured that out by now. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. So, as I said, it's not like a terrible episode. I definitely enjoyed it. Definitely had some great, um, jokes and some great character moments. But a lot of it, I felt, didn't really commit. Commit to the bit, as they say, and it didn't. It seemed like a lot of these side storylines just kind of fizzled out and didn't amount to much. So, um, my rating for Dos Ritos out of ten is going to be a seven. Uh, very good. So, we get to the next episode, which is uh, Shades of Green. So, this is when we get to the Orion stuff, and I just want to point out right away how much i love the the blue orions they never really explain why there are blue orions but um this is definitely a reference to the animated series if you've never seen the animated series uh, they had a an episode called pirates what's it called the pirates of orion i believe uh, which is my favorite episode of the animated series. Um, not that it was, like, amazing or anything, <laughs> because the animated series itself was very mediocre. But of that show, this it was my favorite episode, and they had these... That's exactly what they looked like. They just took the exact look from the animated series and input them there, which is why they're blue or Orions. But what I love is the reference to the fact that they said Orions. Because that really pissed me off about that episode. As much as I like it, it was so irritating. Like everyone in that episode referred to him as Orions. It was like, we Orions. And I was like, it's Orions! Like I want to go mad every time I hear that. And I speculate. I think I heard that it was the director's. It must have been the director's doing that. He didn't know how to pronounce it correctly. And it's like, oh, let's just say Orients and got everyone to say it that way. And so I love the line um, when they're with that trial or whatever in front of the Orion Queen or whatever it was, where. Um, they kept saying <laughs> Orions. Yes, we Orions. And and someone like on Tendi's side was like, It's Orion! Say Orions! <laughs> I was like, Thank you! <laughs> Thank you! That's what I've been saying. I, so I love that joke. I love that, that callback uh, to the whole Orions thing. But, um... Yeah, so the storyline itself, they, they introduced the blue... 
Orions <laughs> in the previous episode, obviously, when they had a... Yeah, the whole thing about um, Tendi like, making sure that they didn't kill anyone, and then the Orion sort of ostracizing her for not killing, it was like, and that's the whole thing, the Blue Orions, <laughs> that was their whole case, is that they didn't act like proper Orion pirates, and that's why they had a whole, like, you know, race to, and I hate the whole race cliche as well, that's, that's really dumb, and then this episode was with, um, Tendi finding out that her sister was pregnant and being, like, very overprotective of her, which at times, I must admit, I did find a bit funny how she was like, here, have a cocoa or something while they're on that bridge, um, but it was over the top, um, I know Lower Decks is over the top a lot, but usually, like, in a funny way, where, I don't know, this one, I mean, that joke I found funny, but overall, I just found it annoying and like, kind of ridiculous that, uh, Tendi was obviously being, like, overprotective of her sister just because she was pregnant. I did think it was kind of funny, though, when they revealed, uh, that she was pregnant and the other Orion women was like, yeah, yeah, we knew about this. And they're like, yeah, it's no big deal. My mother gave birth to me in the middle of combat, in the middle of a sword fight. <laughs> so for yeah for them and but to me that just makes it more ridiculous that how tendy was being so overprotective of her i mean that didn't bother me too much like but i you know i wasn't the biggest fan of it um i did kind of like the relationship with her sister i did like how the other orion pirates like they were like when tendy revealed that she wanted to you know do some be not be a pirate and go to Starfleet. They all revealed that they wanted to do something else because this was, if you recall, the biggest complaint I had about this whole. I'd never liked the thing with Tendi being the mistress of the Winter Solstice or whatever the hell they called her. Um, yeah, I was never a fan of that because it seemed like earlier seasons the whole point was not to stereotype. Uh, Orions and Tendi would get really pissed off when, when people would stereotype them as pirates, but then in later seasons, they're like, no, no, they are all pirates, and her, she, she, in fact, comes from a family of pirates, and she's a pirate princess. To me, that kind of undermined that point, and kind of was stereotyping the Orions, um... And, and that's something I've always hated about Star Trek, that they always have a, a race of hats, how some people call them. Like, Klingons are all honorable and all about combat, and Vulcans are logical, um, Ferengis are conniving and about earning profit, and Cardassians are fascist dictators. Like, And they treat like everyone from that species is exactly the same, and they all act exactly the same. And I always hated that about Star Trek. But to be fair, there's always episodes within Star Trek that defies those tropes. And I always love those episodes, like getting a Ferengi scientist, or, you know, a um, Klingon philosopher, or, you know, stuff like that that um, defies those tropes and shows how complex... Uh, different alien species were so I thought Lower Decks was doing that at first with Tendi but then turned out no we're just going to stereotype them all as pirates but this uh, these two episodes did go a little way of alleviating that and going back to I believe diversifying them when they revealed that the other one's like i want to be a dancer and and i want to you know and that they didn't really want to be pirates either and that when tendy's family lost all their money they were like yeah yeah don't worry we're kind of sick of being having all these assassination attempts in our life anyway <laughs> so that was that was a so I did like what they do with it. So I was very against the whole, oh, Tendi has to go back and be this pirate queen uh, cliffhanger at the end of the last season. I'm like, that's stupid because you're just stereotyping all the Ryans. And to be fair, I think these episodes did pay it off in a way that made me feel better about it. The fact that they were saying, no, well, Orion society is obsessed with being pirates, but a lot of the people in that society don't really want to do that, and they want to diversify and want to do other things. I did think it was kind of funny, too, how 
um, Tendi like blew, <laughs> blew up the treasure. It's like it's a tie. No, we both win. And they go back. It's like no, you're not supposed to blow up the treasure. You both lose everything. <laughs> And, oh, yeah, by the way, the Orians end up, like, working for Tendi's family. <laughs> the Blue Orients. Uh, that, that was kind of funny. But, so, yeah, and I hate the whole race cliche, too. So that, that storyline was okay. It was fine. Um, same with, so the other storyline that we get with um, them going to a society that... I thought that we'd get more commentary on, like... Federation Moneyless Society is about a society transitioning um, to a moneyless society. It seemed, my third first thought was, well, this seems unrealistic. It wouldn't happen overnight. <laughs> like, they wouldn't go from being a capitalist society depending on money and trade to all of a sudden not using money. It would have to be a very gradual thing. And it could be that it was a gradual thing and it was just building and building and building, but then they finally decided to officially make the switch and there was a lot of, you know, rich families that, of course, would be totally against that. Um, but I don't think, again, I, this is another storyline that they didn't really explore that much. They kind of just played lip service to, like, by having the the evil rich people try to kidnap them but then not really have any know how to do it or handle it and they just had these robots the cleaning robots or whatever which was kind of funny but i don't know i don't think they explored it very much they tried to get into boimler's character journey as well a bit more that he was reading the magazine of uh of the parallel universe boimler and like reading articles about him and trying to emulate him he was even trying to grow a beard <laughs> and and beckett uh, was like what the hell's wrong with your face <laughs> i didn't think that was kind of funny but yeah i don't know is he and he was trying to be more relaxed with this like well with his command style first he was being very annoying and being like pointers we call them pointers or something <laughs> and uh how that was annoying the two instances that were working for him um yeah I know. so i think they are going somewhere with his character story i wonder where they're gonna take it though um but yeah overall i didn't really find it all that interesting and um the rich people trying to steal them and then they thought that the incense were dead, but they were just, you know, taking a pointer, <laughs> pointer, whatever you called them, being like, oh, we, we just pretended to be dead, and, and then they just want to go <laughs> and party more or something. Yeah, I don't know. And the whole thing with Rutherford and um, Talyn, that was kind of cute. Uh, it wasn't that big of a deal, but it was it, that he was upset that Talyn fixed the shuttle because um he wanted to drag out fixing it because that's what he used to do with Tendi and uh Talyn basically just wanted to do it to socialize with him and he was like oh that's sweet and whatever and when she, she fixed it all overnight he was like really upset he was like oh no and then they go back and Tendi actually comes back and she's like, oh, we get to work on the shuttle. He's like, oh, about that. And they go there and, and Talyn destroyed the whole shuttle to, like, worse than it was. So I was like, now we have to work on it again. Like, that. that's kind of nice. That was kind of sweet, I guess. Um, so, yeah, overall, it was okay. I'm glad attendees back on the ship. Like, I knew this would happen. At least, they, if you can be fair, they did at least drag it out over two episodes and not totally swipe it free the in one episode off screen <laughs> like they did with the season three finale. But, like, pretty much at the start of the season, the episode comes back immediately with just do this and you can go back to Starfleet. It's, it did deflate the whole thing. But I am glad that we're, we're past this now. Um, yeah, and it was cute that they gave all the money that these aliens were throwing away to Tindy's family so they can be rich again. And that they had the Blue Orions <laughs> working for them. 
like I said. So it's funny. So some character, again, just like I would say with the first episode, some character beats, um, some funny moments. So my rating for, um, um, what's this, this one called again? Shades of Green is also going to be a 7. Very good. So, yeah, that is it for my review of the first two episodes of Lower Decks. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a like uh, or a comment below. Let me know what you think of the episode. Uh, and yeah, if you'd really like to support my channel, you can support me on Patreon. Link will be in the description below. I have different tiers for different availabilities um have different rewards such as uh patron only series that i'm doing where i revisit reviews that i've already made and uh you can request a video to do make comments for me to read my videos that kind of thing if you like you could check it out otherwise you can always support me by leaving a like subscribing leaving a comment that sort of thing also is a huge help so, uh, yeah, so th that is it for that. So just be sure you uh, subscribe so you can keep up with all I got going on. And thanks a lot for watching. <laughs>